Happy Sunday, students. It's the final few days before the finale of East Texas University Study Abroad on Game on Tabletop. So for today's lecture, we brought in a guest, Ed and Preston, Ed Wetterman and Preston DeBose. Welcome, fellas. Hola. Howdy. So yeah, we were just talking in chat before we went live about like the horrors that is daylight savings time and trying to figure out time zones and all of that changing, which is just obnoxious. And we're already a week into it, and it still feels like pain to me. But the it's Ed fun, actually had a really cool story uh, about um, daylight savings time changing, perhaps causing war. Well, I mean, at least making the war worse. So yeah, Ed, what was that story, man? Basically, my understanding is the Japanese ambassador in World War II was supposed to deliver to Washington, D.C., the declaration of war before the attack. Like, they were supposed to deliver that, and then the attack was going to begin. But because of the time zone difference, he was off by, like, two hours or something, and the attack took place. So when he shows up at the White House and says, we're declaring war on you, uh, you know, FDR said, well, thanks for letting us know. Yeah, appreciate <laughs> Yeah, message received. Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was considered very dishonorable to do what they did, I mean, mm -hmm. in the Japanese, so. In their in their culture, yeah, I can't imagine what the repercussions of that were. Oh, I think someone probably got recalled to home. Yeah, well, yeah. So well, they, as, as the Japanese and uh, uh, naval guy said, he says, you know, the admiral, uh, we've just woken a sleeping giant. You know, that's what they did. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the repercussions were a little severe. Loss of their empire, the, uh, you know, a loss of a lot of history. Unfortunately, we talk about that mm -hmm. a lot because the guys downstairs love Japanese martial arts and considering all the, the swords that were lost, oh, it's, yeah. it's heartbreaking. What, just melted, melted down for the war effort or what? Yeah, so they were taken, some were kept in private collections and those are the swords that we have now, but many were melted down or just lit on fire or sunk into the sea and, and are lost. It's, it's an entire martial culture that was really devastated right. and all we have are our writings from the past to go back to kind of like we have for you know the italians and the germans as well so of course now being in the modern era looking for culture martial artists are like trying to grasp these threads mm -hmm. and, and figure mm -hmm. out how things work and luckily the human body can only move so many ways swords can only do so many things sure. so we can kind of figure it out but it's 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 difficult to see what was lost and to see well, you know, the we, we think a lot about the uh, the two ap atomic bomb drops, mm -hmm. but the fire bombings, we destroyed a whole lot more with the fire bombings of Japan than we did the two atomic bombs. Oh. And the, the atomic bombs, the damage after, there are people in Japan who are known as like the other and can only have children with people who also have a history of radiation in their family. Right. So these are devastating effects that are still Yeah, they're still happening. having, uh, they're still generational effects of that. That's pretty crazy. If you want horrible history, there you go. There are true mm -hmm. horrors that came out of the Second World War. But, oh, oh yeah, well, and, and the history, it is very evocative. I mean, like if you go and tour Europe, you can go and see not only trenches from you know the, the First World War mm -hmm. that are still there. I mean, you know, just even even like Neolithic warfare, we're starting to like discover right. how much it changed the landscape and and what forests were taken down. And you know, there's there was I, don't know, I read a great article about three weeks ago about like we found evidence of this this massive like Neolithic battle between like if, if you look at. Um, it's interesting, but like 23andMe and like the, the, the rise of DNA testing for people, um, you can look at your haplogroups, right? And your haplogroups will tell you like your mother's mother's mother and your father's father's father. So like even though you've got, you know, potentially millions of ancestors, it'll trace two of those lines on the tree. And mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of group them. And then people have done some stuff like the the 12 Daughters of Eve or whatever. And they're kind of, you know, they talk about these, these haplogroups. But there's an interesting thing about Europe where you've got – um, there's like a, in Europe in the Neolithic time, there's like the G's and the, the G haplogroup is like the main male one. And then at some point, the R's, R1B and R1A. Wait, wait, aren't that, aren't those the OG's? Right? Yeah, yeah. We're the OG's, right? Exactly. The old G's are there. So, like, if you, you know, the story with like Otzi, he's the, the guy they found, the hiker in Italy who's like prehistoric hiker and he's in the mountains and yeah. he was frozen in the ice and kind of led to the Encino Man movie and stuff like that. And then someone stole his penis. Um, you know, cra crazy life, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, right? The, uh, he was he was a G. Talk about crazy lore. And strange yeah. people in the world, right? Oh my like, gosh. I mean, that's a that's a powerful yeah, juju. Like if they're doing a ritual, like 
<laughs> We've yeah. talked a lot during this. We'll have to add that to the ritual. Right? Yeah. 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 Real life is so much stranger than fiction. In some yeah. cases. It's true. It's yeah. true. The oh um, but the I mean, next time someone says that ETU is a little too far out mm -hmm. there, we'll just talk about yeah. <laughs> No, frozen, no man, man penises. Yep. yep. The ritual. I mean, this is coming from the guys who published, you know, um, Chickens in the Mist. So um, right, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not too worried about going there with this. this crap. I, I've heard many beautiful things about. So. <laughs> oh my God. We need, for Deadwood, we need to run, someone needs to run Chickens in the Mist to Deadwood because it's going to be awesome. But the, yeah, so why we've invited you guys here are you are the two OGs who created East Texas University. So let's delve into that, guys. I mean, how did you, uh, how did you form your gaming company? What did you publish first? How did you think of the idea for East Texas University? Just give us the spill the beans. Go for it. Well, it started off with me and Jerry Blakemore. Um, we had been writing for um, Living Greyhawk. I don't know if you're familiar with that, way back in 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we were part of the Bandit Kingdoms, which was, you know, we ruled. Bandit Kingdoms were awesome. But we, we were writing for the Bandit Kingdoms. And... Um, uh, I'd written a, an interactive and Jerry had written several modules and I'd worked with the triad here. And, and we started saying, you know, what we'd really like to do is try to publish a war game using third edition. And we actually wrote it. Oh my God, we wrote it. It was four or 500 pages of stuff. And, uh, but we never got around to publishing it because we, we started looking at how much it was going to cost us to put a book together and actually get it to print. And as large as this thing was, we were like, we, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. So another friend of mine uh, that I mentioned to you in the last podcast I did with you, uh, one of the original 12 to Midnighters, um, Mark Ramsey came on. He said, well, why don't you guys just start selling some PDFs and make some money and then you can publish your books. And so, okay, well, what are we going to do? And uh, well, let's find a niche that not everybody's doing. If you remember the, the D20 glut uh, 2000 to 2010, you know, that everybody was doing fantasy, like everyone was doing fantasy. So, so what can we do that someone else isn't doing? And we looked around and no one was really doing modern horror. Uh, Call of Cthulhu even had been kind of on a hiatus for a while. I mean, no one was doing it. No one was and doing so, it. And so we said, well, let's, let's do that. And well, where are we going to set it? You know, we have to create a setting. Well, I grew up in East Texas and I've always thought of it as a creepy place as much as I love it. And I, and I do love East Texas. I don't want to offend anyone. I love East Texas. Okay. I'm an East Texan. I'm proud of it. But it's creepy. Okay. It's very creepy. Creepy in like what way? Like uh, American Gothic. Okay. I mean, the, the woods there are ancient. You know, mm -hmm. Native Americans live there forever. You still find Indian mounds that no one's ever, you know, I mean, it's just, I remember Boy Scout camping on Indian mounds. Uh, in someone's field. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of that kind of stuff. And then you got old sawmills way out in the woods. You got old, you know, I, I remember coming across an old uh, barbed wire fence in the middle of the woods where trees had actually grown over it and uh, finding an old tombstone out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, I mean, this is what I grew up with. And so I was like, we have to put it in East Texas. Well, we didn't want to offend anyone in real life. So we created a new town in East Texas called Pine Box. And we created a new county called Dolan County. But we confused a lot of people because I said, if you look on a map and you find 255 and Highway 96, you're in Pine Box. Well, that's just north of Jasper, Texas, okay? And it, that those two highways exist. But if you go there, you just see woods. Pine Box doesn't exist in real life. But I've confused some folks with that. So that's Dolan County and that's the Pine Box. Now, Golan sounds a little like Golan which is a, a, a Native American word for raven. Mm. That's where the raven comes from. So it's Golden County, is Raven County. Um, and uh, we go to a con where we're running, I think it was Weekend Warriors, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Aggie Con here. It was one of the first cons that me and Jerry worked. And this guy Preston sat down at our table and played with us. And he's like, this is pretty good, but it can be better. And we're like, I okay. <laughs> Okay, he says, here's my card if you're interested. So back in those days, what we would do, if you showed talent, we didn't want to pay you. We wanted you just to join us and be like, you know, have to pay yourself just like we did. So we said, why don't you become a partner? And he said, okay. And that's how Neil Hyde became a partner as well. Uh, we just kept growing the company by saying, you want to be a partner? I'm like, okay. 
So that's how we grew the company. Like a Ponzi scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, no one ever made any money. So it, it was definitely a Ponzi scheme. Uh, but the fame has all been worth it, right? Yeah. So the yeah. first adventure we published was uh, uh, Last Rites of the Black Guard. Uh, that's one that I wrote and, and, and really loved. Uh, then we did Weekend Warriors. So I got to tell a little funny story about Last Rites. Just, just a tiny story. So um, I met him in March. The, the first adventure, Last Rites, hadn't come out yet. Uh, it was still in editing, so I helped edit it. And Poorly. One of the, one of the reasons mm -hmm. they um, recruited me is that I actually knew how to do layout. Like I had InDesign, and I could lay out a book. And they didn't have anyone that could do that. So, again, hey, free talent, right? So, new um, partner. Right, new partner. <laughs> So I got recruited to do layout. We, we had solicited all the artwork, you know, all of this stuff was coming in. I was getting ready. Well, my son was born in July. And so I had an infant in the house and trying to lay out our very first product um, while I had, you know, sleep deprivation and brand new parent and all of that stuff going on. He had hair then. I, I did. I had hair then. And really. you, had a, you had a beard recently and you've gotten rid of it. So I'm, I'm calling shenanigans on that. So it was yeah, a very yeah, nice beard. It's true. I've, there's, there's a story behind that, but it's okay. much less interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically a month after my son was born, uh, we, we re released Last Rites. Wow. Hey, man, we, just, we, we went and got a good artist. We went and got Aneth Legamo. She yeah. was straight out of a, I, I found her online going through thousands of artists. And she was a starving artist just getting started, just graduating art school. And uh, I think we paid, what, 300 it wasn't very much for an oil painting that I actually have hanging in my, in my office oh, wow. of the Last Rites cover. And, and she just did a fantastic job. I love Aneth Legamo. She's going to do so much bigger and better things. We could never afford her now. Uh, but she is just an amazing artist. And she, yep. the thing she does with watercolors are superb. Yep. So we said, okay, we've got the art. We've got, a, we've got a good story. We've got it laid out. Let's make some money. And we put it out there for people to buy. And we sold, I think, like 20 copies the first month. Yeah, it was more than that. But it was terrible. It was not what they were expecting. So we're like, okay, we're never going to make enough money to even pay Anna. So <laughs> this, we met and we, we got together and said, okay, we give it to college try. Should we continue or should we quit? Yeah. Well, we, there was two reasons to continue. One, we got a letter or an email. Not a letter. That's how old I am. We got an email from Shane Hensley saying, I really like this. I've got a new game called Savage Worlds, and I want this to be the first adventure for it. He said, I will personally convert it to Savage Worlds. And you guys can have 100% of the profits. Okay. Sounds like a plan. And then the other email we got um, was from, what was his name? I don't know. Uh, D20. Oh, he's such a good guy. And, I'm, and we got an email from someone a, else in the industry. Someone else in the industry. And he, he took the time to actually write us a three or four page letter saying, if you're going to be in the industry, this is the standard you need to start hitting because we didn't hit that. Yeah. Mm. My writing know. was terrible if you own the first last rights d20 version burn it it's terrible <laughs> but terrible. ritually no no wait save it for a ritual i mean we've already talked about how it's, crazy it's, old stuff like, can be used in rituals it's so. written everything was future tense will 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 i went through and actually highlighted all the wills in one copy and just cried over it I'm like this is oh. terrible no, we just didn't know any better right but and, we and it was still great enough that people liked it and wanted to give constructive feedback and say, hey, we, we see potential here. You Which just need to. Shane Hensley absolutely yeah. saved 12 to Midnight. Yeah. And the and the, the, the people that play Savage Worlds saved 12 to Midnight yeah. because they bought it and they loved it. And uh, it just took off from there. So we published Weekend Warriors for D20 and Savage Worlds. We published Ananas Kiss for D20 and Savage Worlds. And my favorite adventure ever, Bloodlines, yeah. written by this guy. Chickens in the mist, to be yeah. honest. Here. If, it, if you're talking about just straight up adventure for a campaign, Bloodlines is the absolute best. I love it. The handouts and everything on that is is just amazing. And uh, I, you know, someday I would like to see us put out a new version of that. Uh, and he says no, but I love it. I mean, it is my absolute favorite. And Anna Fagamo did the cover of that one yeah. as well. Um, and so we just kept growing. And what we found was 
the more we put out, the more things in our backlog on yeah. was was yeah. was being sold. People kept discovering us for the first time and then going back and and, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And by two thousand seven, two thousand eight, I think it was somewhere in there, we were we were really doing well. We had like four other companies working underneath us selling through our site. Uh, and we were just taking 10% of all their profits, which was, hello, that's great. The thing was, though, we realized we were becoming publishers. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do was be published. We're writers and creators. I hate the publishing aspect of everything. I don't like dealing with contracts. I don't like having to do all that. Finding artists, paying people, trying to get everything, you know, all your ducks in a row. That was not something we wanted. So by 2009, we had an agreement. We said, okay, well, we want to do Pine Box and East Texas University. Now, I'm not sure where ETU came from. Do you remember? I don't know. We were brainstorming ideas. I think I mentioned this on the last interview. We, we had several ideas for campaigns set in Pine Box. We knew that we need to narrow it beyond just Pine Box itself. We needed a theme, right? And one theme was ETU. Another theme was uh, you'd play a, a police deputy and answer strange calls around town. So I still think it would be fun. But it'd be, it'd be awesome. Just haven't gotten around to it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I mean, we brainstormed several different themes and ultimately we decided that, that the idea of playing college students in this very weird occult setting would be a lot of fun. So that's the one we zeroed in on. And I'm a huge Buffy fan and season four of Buffy was terrible. <laughs> so we do. We gotta do it and we gotta do it right. Yeah. My, my favorite, so Pine Box, I mean, obviously people, if you don't get the, the pun, like Pine Boxes are like coffins, right? You get buried in a yeah. Pine Box. And um, the best, uh, when I first met Ed, first had him out here, um, to one of the conventions years ago. In addition to like swapping dice, because we all make custom dice for our groups, and there's a, mm -hmm. a big group of Texas savages. You guys have like the Lone Star Savage dice, which are a hot commodity up here. We're um, just copying you guys, man. We're hoping to get like you. <laughs> right, right. But the uh, ad, it was amazing. Uh, playing a character, the uh, you got a toe tag. Um, so yep. like it for corpses. Oh, um, so like it. That's fan. I still have my toe tag. It's in my dice awesome. box. <laughs> yeah. And I'm um, like, nice. yeah, this is brilliant. Yeah. And um, so yeah, right. That's that's creative stuff there. That's there's some genius so, in that. In 2009, we were getting burned out being publishers, mm -hmm. and we wanted to stop being publishers. And you know, so we said, well, we promised everybody ETU for so long, we have got to get it done. So Preston and I wrote the first version of ETU with everything but the kitchen plus the kitchen sink. I mean, it was huge. We had technology. We had robots. We had it was going to be crazy, our song, crazy right? stuff. Right. We were just going to get it. here. You go. It's everything we got. Yeah. Have fun. And, uh, and 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 we just kind of got bogged down. So then we started talking to Shane and said, you know, we're we're thinking about being done with this. And we had talked to Shane about ETU several times at conventions and things. And he said, well, if you guys are done with that, he says, let's let's bring you in. Let's let's work on this. Um, and so we did. And, and we basically partnered with uh, uh, Pinnacle and became part of Pinnacle and line directors for ETU. And, uh, you know, Shane is one of the greatest guys you'll ever work with. And uh, I love him like a brother. And, uh, you know, he's pretty much given us carte blanche. He said, if you want to do it, do it. And the, the problem is now that we're old, we don't do it like we used to do it. <laughs> um, so we got ETU out. It took about three more writes, writings and rewrites. Um, uh, uh, who was our editor? Uh, John. Yeah, John. Um, John was our editor. And he, the first time he said, guys, you got to get rid of about a third of the book. Yeah. He said, it's crazy. You cannot have technology and supernatural and everything that you did. Take out the kitchen sink. We don't want that. So this was, before, this was before rest, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But we still have a ton of stuff that we just scrapped and threw yeah. in the pile. Um, so we were thrilled when it finally came out. Um, and it's much better than that kitchen sink version. It's much without better. a doubt. Much it's, it's much more focused. Yeah. It's, it's a much better book. And we've had a lot more fun just writing and not being publishers yeah so yeah so the uh that's a good segue so how did um study abroad come about the uh, was it an original concept like whose idea was it had that how what was the the, the the origin of study abroad well um 
so this is something that ended up on the cutting room floor actually for ETU. Um, in the original version of the plot point, I wanted to send the students off to Costa Rica for a semester. And so that was in the original plot point. They were going to get kicked off a of campus for causing too much trouble and, and sent off. And sent away. So, so that was the first version of, of the plot point. The problem was there were so many things, that so much connective tissue that needed to happen within the plot points to get from A to B to C to D, right? Mm -hmm. That within a one semester study abroad um, session, I couldn't cram everything in that needed to happen. And it broke my heart, but I, I just had to cut all of that stuff that happened in study abroad, bring it back to uh, to Pine Box to make everything line up the way it needed to. For and I think John had something to do with that too. Yeah, I well, think John yeah, was I, like, I mean, guys, this is about ETU, it's not about Costa Rica. Well, I think more than that, it was that, um, you know, th there's, there's three plot point adventures per, year class year mm -hmm. and you know i had an opening adventure in costa rica and a closing adventure in costa rica and then one that happened the next semester on campus but there was so much that needed to happen in costa rica from the opening to the close it was just it, there was no way to cram it all in it, it didn't make sense and yes john's the one that told me look you've got to face the facts it's it's not doing what you want to do and so you have to kill your darlings when you're a writer. And that was the one that I had to do. Yeah, I, think, I love the one that Preston wrote about the 1950s scientist that created a, a thing, an AI robot and then forgot about it. And then, you know, the, 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 the somewhere deep in East Texas University, you know, the students discover this robot. I thought that was awesome, but it was not supernatural. So we, we dropped yeah. it. Oh. I still want to use that one of these. Things. I want it, yes. Yeah. So, so anyway, after after cutting Costa Rica, it made me so sad. Um, and I was thinking about it a couple years later and thought, you know, there's still an opportunity to do study abroad as its own supplement. And it doesn't have to be limited to Costa Rica. In fact, let's not even worry about Costa Rica because all of those original plots don't exist anymore that, you know, they got rewritten into the main play into degrees of horror. So let's just find some new locations and have new adventures and let's get them written by people who live in those countries. So I pitched the idea to Shane and he said, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. And so then we reached out to the translation partners uh, of Pinnacles around the, the world to see who was interested in participating. And um, we we um, we had four we had four participants. Unfortunately, one had to drop out. And uh, in scrambling to find a replacement, I said, "Well, you know, we can do Costa Rica after all." And so I got this good Costa Rica stuff, guys. Yeah, I know I, I, well, Shane's this. like, "Whatever, just all do right, it. Just yeah. get it done." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, so yeah, we had the three, and then we went back, and I. I'm actually friends with an expat living in Costa Rica. So the the other three are written by people living in country and Costa Rica was written by me, but in consultation with, with an expat living in Costa Rica. So I feel that counts. And, and for me, I'll say that, you know, all these translations of ETU that's all around the world just blows my mind. You know, that, 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 that this Russian, it's Italian, it's Polish, it's, you yeah. know, it, it's all around the world. And I, and I love that, that just, because we really are just one big community and it doesn't matter what your nationality is. Uh, we're gamers and we are Savage Worlds players and, you know, and, and that's, that means a lot to me. Yeah. I mean, it really does. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that dovetails nicely with the stream we did earlier today, talking with Gilbert and, and Chris Fox about just kind of the, the universality of gaming and how, mm -hmm. Um, you know, having something to do with people that are, you know, even there's even a, there's a bit of a language barrier, like eating is certainly universal. And then gaming, I mean, you know, if you, if you find gamers, you does the language barrier is not too, too much of a problem. You right. know, it, it is people who want to have experiences with other people that are fun, that are cooperative, mm -hmm. that are they the chance, tell stories. you know, that there is, right. Let's tell some fun yeah, stories. Yeah. I like to tell and, stories. And that's why it's so important that everyone be a, you know, be allowed at every table. You know, it's gotta be inclusive. Everyone, everyone, regardless of your background, your sexual preference, whatever, when we're gaming, we're the same. Yep. And, and there should be no differences and everyone should be welcome at that table. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and that's, I think that's one of the cool things about COVID is that the opportunities to grow that element of gaming have become so much stronger this last year and a half. Um, you know, the virtual tabletop has had a renaissance mm-hmm. and they've gotten really good and they're getting better. I think just this couple of days ago, all of the Savage Worlds core is now on Roll20, mm-hmm. uh, which means there's a whole lot of automation. So you don't have to program a lot of that yourself. You can just get, you know, you buy the, the Roll20 package, uh, super straightforward. And then, you know, some new challengers have entered the market, like, um, uh, you know, uh, Fantasy Grounds, Roll20 are kind of the, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the old standbys. And then the Foundry is a kind of newer one mm-hmm. that I've heard a lot of people are enjoying, kind of the layout of Foundry. And, and there's just, the, 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 uh, even after we start gaming together back in person, and I, there is a lot of in-person stuff I miss, and I know that you know, that will never go away. Um, but just the ability to game over with people from anywhere in the world with any ability mm-hmm. levels. You know, we had a um, uh, a cool guy who was playing with us during Halloween who had some um, uh, what would you call them? health challenges um, on on how he, you know he needed certain adaptive elements to help him mm-hmm. you know, help him game. But we figured it out. We found some plugins, and you know, it, between the technology we were using and the game masters, it all worked out so he could actually play the games like everybody else. Also, and, a lot uh, of people who are like, I I can't travel to conventions. I have so much right, anxiety, right, or right. I just can't travel. And being online, being able to just hop in and game and not have to worry about that. I don't have to show my face. I can use my voice. I can use the chat. This is now accessible to me. And that I didn't even realize that those people had been cut off, unfortunately, but they were so happy to be at an online convention that that has to stay now. It has to be part of it because we want those people at the table regardless. So it was really uh, For me, I live still live out in the boonies of Central Texas, so I don't have very good internet. That's why I'm over here at Preston's house now. <laughs> um, without without having good internet, you know, I don't get to really enjoy a lot of what uh, of what we're talking about here—the virtual gaming. But uh, maybe someday, a little Caldwell will catch up with the rest of the 21st century, and we'll actually get internet capacity. Well, and, and poor you, like you're going to get PTSD because you got to run some of your classes virtual. So it's it's like the you know it's the same thing, yeah. but not as fun. But the yes, right? Escape Pod Games comments: Our Sunday ETU group is international. We have a member in the Philippines, Canada, two in Texas, and one in Kuwait. Wow, that is awesome! Wow, that is fantastic. Scheduling a time for that yeah. got to be killer. I'm gonna play at three in the morning. You're gonna play at yeah. seven. And- Wow, that and, is. And think how much trouble we had just figuring out the four time zones of the yeah. continental United States. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Throwing yeah. in the Philippines and yeah. Kuwait. I tip and my hat to you. Figure that out. Good luck, man. That You're a lot smarter amazing. individual than I am. Yeah. Jeez. That's mm-hmm. dedication there. We yeah. appreciate that. You guys do, must be good at math. Yeah. I do have to ask Preston, why Costa Rica? What What drew you to Costa Rica for ETU? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh. Jurassic Park. Okay. Um, I love the imagery from the movie, right? The, is, according to the book, it was an island off the coast of Costa Rica. Okay. And so in the orig- original plot point, it wasn't Costa Rica itself. It was an island that um, Texas was leasing or, or ETU was leasing from Costa Rica, just like kind of the Jurassic Park, right? And it was called the uh, Isla de, del Tejas. So it was an island of Texas. Yeah. And so not only were they, uh, you know, far from home, they were literally trapped on an island. And they would, were going to have to solve mysteries and survive here for a semester. So that would have been really cool. But, you know, whatever. I remember asking, um, like, well, what do I do about the, the – because the, I was writing the Savage Tales. I'm like, do I come up with a, like – Five savage tales for you because you're gonna take it out yeah. of the country. Yeah. Well, and maybe maybe you were we maybe in the adventure you're not resurrecting long dead dinosaurs, but I've seen some of the art and there's definitely resurrecting long dead stuff going on in, in the coast. Oh of well, I, I mean it was all about the chupacabras, right? I mean you were in chupacabra home territory there on this island, and uh, sweetheart played a role mm-hmm. and. Like there was a lot going on on this. And, and there's a lot time. of background history that Preston and I came up with that has never seen publication. Yeah. I mean, it's all, there was actually background for everything that we did. Yeah. And Costa Rica was where they were developing the chupacabras and the, and the, uh, the uh, what was it called? The muster? 
in the very first plot point? The needler. The needler. Yeah. Oh my gosh, my brain is dead. Yeah. That's where the needler was invented, right? Yeah. So, so that you know, we had reason for all that. Yeah. It sounds like you two have a book to write that fans will eat up. <laughs> we yeah. did. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's that's where it came from. It's it started with the imagery of Jurassic Park and the island, that lush tropical jungle. Mm -hmm. um, and I just like the idea of trapping them on this island for a semester. So that didn't pan out. So, so I mean, there's not an island in study abroad, right? Mm -hmm. We just went with the actual country of Costa Rica, which is cool enough. I mean, there's- uh, They don't so need to make it Texas. To yeah, cool. yeah. Now, there's a, there's a lot of stool, cool stuff to, to enjoy just in the country itself. So, so uh, Presto, I want to circle back on where your majestic beard went because um, it's a crime uh -huh. against humanity. Shade it. But so Ed, Ed, Ed mentioned that he went on Boy Scouting trips into the creepy um, East Texas. Uh, you got to go on a Boy Scouting trip to the U.S. Virgin Islands. <laughs> oh, God, let me cry a tear for <laughs> that. I oh, know. The, the struggle. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. my God. The. Oh, it must so have been so let me tell on Preston. Let me tell on Preston. Do you I travel, yeah, I do. He's just got back from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Had a, you know, he shows his pictures of this beautiful blue water, all this stuff. You know, he's out there having a good time. I drive up. His beautiful wife is outside mowing the yard. And I went up to her and I said, don't you have a teenage son, a teenage daughter and a husband? And I said, you shouldn't be doing this. And she says, well, he's in there on the couch watching TV with my son. <laughs> I said, he just got back from vacation and you got him sitting on the couch watching movies? You are killing me. You're, 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 you're terrible. You're terrible. You're terrible. Yeah. No, no, he, he's making her do all that work. She wanted to get out oh and gosh. get some exercise. Yeah, that's she not, wanted yeah, to do. Because people it. want to mow the grass. Preston is leading the charge for equal right and equal that's, pay for women. Yeah. And that's what it was. Yeah. feminism, baby, go girls. Go mow the hashtag, hashtag feminism. It is yes. supposed to be equal. Hashtag As a woman, equality. I will say yes. Fine. <laughs> so, so yeah, how how does one like when I did Boy Scouts, it was like at a reservoir or like at yeah. a crappy camp. How does one get to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands? All right, for so there is in Boy Scouts, like the pinnacle of 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 um, these trips are, are what they call high adventure bases. So the the mecca of Boy Scouts is Philmont, right? If you get to go to Philmont and hike Philmont, that's a really big deal. But mm -hmm. Philmont isn't the only one. Uh, there's Northern, so so Philmont's about hiking the mountains. Uh, there's another one called Northern Tier, which is about canoeing. And so we've we've done Philmont and we did Northern Tier, and then the the third is called Sea Base, and it's um, different locations. You can do it in Florida, you can or you can do it in the U.S. Virgin Islands or or the the Keys, whatever. And so it, it just, the way it worked out was that another group from another troop was going to, um, to the sea base in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and they had room for my son and I, and so we said, sure, we'll, we'll go with you. So we went there. It was a sailing trip with oh, snorkeling. Wow. So oh, nice. it was sailing and, and snorkeling, and I got a, a, a snorkel sunburn. Like, this part is kind of white. And then all of this is really tanned because they, you know I was doing this number, so yeah, kind of kind of a weird tan, but yeah, that's that's what it was. So we we've done the. So the, what, did you did you get sand plant. fleas in your sand fleas in your beard, and that's why you had to shave it? Oh no! So the reason I shaved the beard was so that the the mask would fit, and I'd actually get a seal here, yeah. and would you know wouldn't <laughs> my mask wouldn't fill with water. Now that I'm important. now that I'm done, I fully intend on getting the beard. There we go. That's Good, good. Okay, you're welcome back in the club. Like so the, I, I do. I, <laughs> I know you so do. Weird. You know. It's really weird. I mean, if you started crying, we'd spank you and change your diaper. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So the <laughs> so what did you see? What cool stuff did you see snorkeling? Because I, I can only um, imagine what that steps under. Well, the I guess the coolest would be the sea turtles. Mm -hmm. um, like got to swim around and, and check them out. Um, and then just a lot of fish up close, coral, uh, got some up close looks at sea urchins, which you don't want to mess with. Um, yeah. 
when those barbs go in, apparently they, they just flat out don't come out. They have to dissolve Ooh. in your body. Ooh. It can like, take like two months. My Ooh. brother has Barbed stepped it. on many a sea urchin. Yikes. Let me tell you. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, we were very fortunate. No one on our group had a sea urchin accident. We were very, really, very really lucky. Yeah. You know, Lake Greystone, you only have to worry about giant alligators. Right. That's it. Or giant catfish. Yeah, giant catfish, too. Yeah. No sea urchins. No. Sea turtles, like um, what was the movie Finding Dory and and the one before yeah, that was yeah, yeah. Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. Yes, yes. Yeah. They, they make the sea turtles like cowabunga dudes. They yeah. really are one of the chillest species. They're like, super chill. Yeah, they just look at you and they're swimming. Yeah. It's like, oh my god, you are just a chill, cool thing. And yeah. uh, I was surprised. I saw them off of the coast of Maui. Um, they're huge. I had yeah. Yeah, no are. idea that that. Yeah. Oh, you you could end my day right here if you got nasty. But you yeah. know what's meaner than an alligator in East Texas? What? Snapping turtles. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. You don't mess with snap. They will take yeah. your finger right off. Yeah. Like they don't play. Yeah. Snapping turtles don't play, yeah. and they can get huge. Yeah. Craig, the guy that wrote uh, Chickens in the Mist, came across one that was about. I can see uh, right sea turtles. Right. Yeah. Just about sea turtles. Right. It was yeah. huge, and. Uh, yeah, they're out there. Yeah, they absolutely will. I mean, if you've seen their jaws, mm -hmm. they will take a finger off. They're yeah. like a vice. Oh, goodness. Yeah, no, what they I was going to tell a story about alligator gar, which if you're mm -hmm. familiar with alligator gar, it's it's a fish, but it's got this giant maw, like alligator teeth. type maw. It grows 20 feet long. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there in East Texas waters. Tell sure. a story about um, canoeing in the river. And it was about um, about dusk, and the buddy he was in the canoe with said, "Well, let's tie up against that log there and get some fishing in." And they got close to the log, and it wasn't a log; it was this alligator gar that was floated wow. at the top of the water. Yeah. So, uh, Boy Scout story. Okay. Troop one thirty seven, the infamous Troop one thirty seven of East yeah, Texas. One thirty seven. We've hashtag. got tons and tons of material on these two. <laughs> anyway, we weren't good. We didn't go to really cool places we just stayed in east texas and i'll never forget one get crazy guy I'm friend with named wayne walker we're all down there playing in a slough right a, a swampy real swampy low area next to the river and a uh we came across a three foot alligator guard just and it was three feet of water right you could look down and see him and we got trees and stuff all around us there's like 12 boys in the water so what does wayne do get it and he jumps with a with a stick well, this alligator gar starts just going crazy, and we're in the water with it, and we're all like, yeah! I'm running like yeah, that's how that was my Boy Scout experience. <laughs> and I got the yeah. face, don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> you win. How do you guys oh, swim in that water? Yeah. There's so it's much really, going on. Yeah. You swim in a, a creek here and you're fine. You know, <laughs> worst thing you have to worry about is maybe leeches, but you can just burn those off with a lighter. So who cares? You don't have to worry about alligator oh bars or snapping turtles or yeah, no, giant catfish. Stand by me flashbacks. Yeah. yeah. yeah poor little Wesley and his little tidy whiteies. Anyways, the, uh, no, when I was a kid, my mom's side's from Chicago. And so they used to go to like um, Schaefer Lake, which is like Indiana Beach. Um, for you know, like the little cabins around there, and the um, when I, was, I was a little kid, maybe like six or seven, and the uh, the only thing I ever caught the whole summer was this like the same carp. It's just huge, fat ass carp. And for anyone like I was like, you, you can't eat carp; they're not they're bad eating. Um, so th this carp, he was so dumb because he just sit by the dock and eat all the food that we throw in on the end of the line. And so you know, you'd catch him, you'd pull him out, you'd take the hook out, you'd throw this just giant carp back in. And so by the end of the summer, he had his big white spot on his cheek where like he like lost pigmentation from us pulling the hook out so much. And so we knew, I mean, we knew this carp. Well, on the last day I was, you know, so we did this twice. And the night before we were gonna leave, throw the line in, get, and it feels like this carp and they're heavy fish. And we're pulling and we're pulling and I pull out a snapping turtle. And oh my God, that was my first encounter with a snapping turtle. They are not nice creatures. The, uh, yeah, no, no. The, the the guy who was like the manager of the area, like he like lived in the cabin with his wife full time. He like had the, the last digit of his pinky was gone from a snapping turtle just biting it off, just clean off. 
And we were asking, like, you know, did you take it to go have it returned? Or and he's like, no, the turtle bit it off and swam back into the lake, and that was it. There was like, <laughs> it's gone. Let me just open his jaws and grab it real quick. Right, and it was like the, that's the old, why I don't needle. Okay, my friends in East Texas stick their hands in little holes in the side of the river and stuff, oh, trying man. to catch catfish. You could catch a snapping turtle or an alligator gar or you know a, as a water moccasin just as easy as a uh, catfish. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I've Missouri, seen it on TV. When it's I was crazy. a kid in Missouri, we would do that for catfish, but there was nothing else in there. So mm. there, was, there was no worry. It was only catfish. Well, Chelsea, you need to come down to East Texas. <laughs> and you know, Scar and, me for life. Yeah, sure. You can have a real adventure. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can change that. The, uh, well, so, so Price, on the Caribbean thing, uh, while you're in the, did you guys actually do any sailing on the ship you were on? Like, What was the ship like? Oh yeah, no. The, the The whole point was that it was a sailing adventure, and the boys were supposed to learn how to sail. So they learned navigation, they learned sailing techniques. You know how to tack into the wind. Um, they each got to pilot the boat. Um, you know they cooked meals in the galley. It, it was the whole um, whole experience. So c can you adopt me and take me next year, please? <laughs> Landauer, you know that my family has a boat up on Dillon Lake. We can teach you how to sail. Yeah, but see, when you fall, when you're a fat ass who's leaning on the boat, you're like, you need to put your weight back so that it gets the wind. And you're on Dillon Lake, and you fall in, you freeze. You um, when you're on the yeah. <laughs> islands, it's warm and clear. There might be sharks, but whatevs. Um, <laughs> we did see a shark. That's true. We did see. Oh, a shark. what kind of shark did you one. see? Uh, I think it was a tiger shark. It, it was only about two feet long. It wasn't. Right. It wasn't a big one. It was a baby. Yeah, I saw an actual video of uh, supposedly out, out of Galveston, some orcas. I didn't think they. No. They, they swore it was coming. I'm like, no. okay. they swore it was. I'm like, I didn't think that's possible. That's I'm, terrifying that's because not, that's the wrong part of, that, right? part of the. World. But that's what they said. I mean, I can't believe everything's seen on the internet. So. <laughs> I mean, there's some weird activity with orcas lately because orcas have been pushing sharks out of the ocean because they're nasty buggers. People mm -hmm. are like, orcas are so beautiful and so incredible. Killer whales are terrifying. They are mm -hmm. awful. They play they're with their cool. prey. They push things out of the freaking ocean. They are not nice creatures. <laughs> God damn. It does say that, that two days ago, a group got video of an orca pod in the Gulf of Mexico off of Galveston. That's, that's crazy. That's it. Huh. Wow. Yay, global warming. Stranger than fiction. Yeah, man. Orcas. So now we have to worry about orcas in, yeah. in New Texas. That's right. I, yeah. I would be scared of those because everyone like like that like yeah, they're not they're not killer whales, they're whale killers. Like they if you it, it's funny, like when you ever watch like Discovery and like if the Discovery shows the, the the nature documentary from like the point of view of the seals. Like, oh, yeah, you're rooting for the seals. And, oh, the orcas are so bad. But, like, you know, but if they show it from the point of view of, like, the orcas, you're like, who cares about the polar bears and the seals? Go eat them. You need food, too. Right. Yeah. Um, but, oh, my so, God, yeah. they're they are not – they don't play around. They don't mess around. There's, like, they have big teeth and they are predators and they play with their food. So, wow. I, I, I guess – the same uh, reason I don't like bears. I like I'm yeah. on record. I'm scared of bears. It's one reason I don't live in Colorado. Bears scare Ed. They We're do. okay. Bears are nice. I, honestly, I have bears. lived in Colorado my entire life. I have never yeah. seen a bear. I have I have been camping my entire life, never seen a bear. Well, Neil Hines says there's like two bears that come down and right behind his house almost every week. Well, where does Neil live? Right there in Denver. Yeah, he's over on the west side of town, over by Chatfield High School, I think. Over so um, by Chatfield? Really? Yeah. What? Yeah. The, uh, no. I, I've seen I've seen Picture bears. It didn't happen. <laughs> the uh, up in Copper Mountain, um, I've seen bears raiding the trash, like little black bears. Um, I mean, we've uh, friends up in. We used to hike up in Kit Ridge because our friend is a lumberjack, a good old fashioned lumberjack with twirly mustache uh, and big muscles and everything. Okay. So we hike the the logging trails, the old school logging trails, because nobody's there especially during COVID times, because we don't want to run into anybody. And I still have not seen a bear in person. I am grateful for this. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Yeah, no, I've seen, I've never seen black bears. And black bears are cute. They're smaller. Like, they're probably not going to eat you. Yeah, you can away. <laughs> right? The, um, but, uh, all. deer all the time in our front yard. When I was in Scotland, it was really funny. There was a gal who had moved to this tiny town up north in Scotland. She's like, I woke up this morning and there were deer in my yard. And I'm like, yeah, that happens. She's like, where are you from? Colorado. Yeah. Oh, 
That's weird. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> like it's yeah. just deer. They're so, fine. The state They'll lost spook. games. Said, uh, don't tell Ed bears are back in Sam Houston National Forest. I know. I know they are. That's because of Louisiana. Louisiana reintroduced black bears. My ancestors killed them all. We got rid of them, so we wouldn't be scared of them anymore. Louisiana says, oh, we need black bears. They bring black bears back. They're now in East Texas, and they're moving towards me. Towards him. So I'm going to have to move further to Arizona. I've got to go. I can't do where this <laughs> They have tarantulas right, in Arizona. Bears. Ridiculous. Oh, but tarantulas are so sweet. All right. New savage tale involving bears coming up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we can probably, like, the I've seen bears in, I saw grizzlies in Yellowstone. And um, maybe maybe when we go to Deadwood, we should do a little, like, get out of town and find the wild. Because, like, there's a, one of the one of the things we can do up in Deadwood, um, you know, uh, pimping the savage. Okay, if you like sailing and gaming, like Presto, you can come on Savage Cruise. And uh, we're leaving out of uh, Orlando and going down to Belize. Not quite Costa Rica, a little far. But Belize is a good stand. And there's definitely a, a sacrificial temples we can visit that are in the same, you know, with Mayan where, where versus the Aztec. Pyramid, where are the pyramids that you want to see? All, all three places have pyramids. So there's like oh. Chichen Itza at, in Cozumel. And then there's like Costa Maya has like, um, there's Tulum and there's another, like, there's pyramids there. And then there's also pyramids in Belize. So all the pyramids. Oh, no. The, um, yeah. I, I, think, I think I'll probably do like two pyramid trips and then do one of like the like pet the fuzzy underwater animals, like the sharks or the eels or the rays. Because that's fun. And um, on the last cruise, I did the, the stingrays, which are awesome. That was in Grand Cayman. The, very cool. They're very nice. And then I did the dolphin swim. And um, so, you know, me, me, meeting nature and not eating it. It's like very, you know, it's cool. But the Yellowstone, I saw a grizzly, a grizzly bear mom and her cub. And that was like several hundred yards away. And that was about the right distance. It was mm -hmm. like, if, if they charge us, I have just enough time to get back to the car and then, you know, wish I were dead versus actually being eaten and being dead. And um, if a grizzly wanted to take your car apart, it could. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. There's uh, the, uh, it was just funny. We were talking about like, so like the, in the, in the, the Mandalorian, the, the, the buyer for the initial, in the initial episode is Werner Herzog, right? The, the guy who's yeah. in white and he's a famous documentarian who, who does, I don't know. It's called cinema verite, but it's not really all that, Verite on the truthful side. Um, it's got a little scripting to it, let's just say. But he did a great documentary on Timothy Treadwell called Grizzly Man. And Timothy Treadwell is insane. It's insane. This guy went up for several different summers and in Alaska to a bear reserve, a whole big park, Kat Katmai Park, I think is what it was. And he would go and film these bears and he made personal relationships with them. Well, when the bears are fishing and they're getting fat, you as a human don't look like a meal. So he was mostly okay with hanging out with the female bears. But then when it comes time to like mate and then go into hibernation, the food gets a lot scarcer and the males get very aggressive and the females get very protective. So yeah, he stayed overstayed his welcome and he and his girlfriend got eaten by a grizzly and it all got recorded. Um, yeah. I don't that think it's a documentary, right? The, yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought you were talking about I the saw that whole thing. I said, you're an idiot. <laughs> I know that, you're just an idiot. You're playing with animals that will eat you. You're an idiot. I got no, I mean, you can love bears. Okay. I don't, but you can. That's cool. I love nature. I want to protect nature. I want to protect bears. I just don't want them in East Texas. Okay. Uh, yeah. you know, but, but yeah, if you're, if you're going to go play with those kind of animals, you're eventually going to become scat. Yeah, I there's that guy. talking about the guy who uh, tried to make a grizzly proof suit because he got mauled by a bear. <laughs> Did and so it not he work? tried to make a grizzly proof suit and tested it and went up and got eaten by a bear. <laughs> That's the problem if you're doing the prototypes and it doesn't work. Uh, you get one one shot. One yeah. shot. One shot. Yeah. Having, having worked with cattle all my life, I mean, I'm used to really, really large animals that have the potential to hurt you, but for the most part, don't. So I just think we need to introduce a bear domestication program <laughs> so that we can have our domesticated. I want a house bear. You know, you want I, a just house want, bear? I just want a house bear. I will have an alligator for a pet before I have a bear. <laughs> oh, that's that's you. Okay. I want a house bear. Anyway, I, I, I'm a little cute little like, you know, Pomeranian sized actual teddy bear would be 
Oh, so amazing. Uh, so, okay, here, crazy story. We're not talking about gaming yet. I mean, we just all over the place. <laughs> what are we here for? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, so people love us. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, buy new Savage Tales. Right? Yeah. Listen, people, go Your buy Study of Pride. Go buy it. <laughs> buy it right now so we can talk about um, raising domesticated wild animals because that's what we really want to talk about. So I breed Border Collies, you know, kind of a family thing. We had them in, 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 in the family for generations. And um, I started writing a border collie blog, and and I because I studied um, some genetics in college, I was kind of applying some scientific -y genetic stuff to the closed registries that we use for dogs. Like in the dog world, it's like the horse world, but like for people who aren't quite as rich. And uh, you know, so if you got big money, you can have horses. If you've got whatever, you're okay. You can do dogs. Um, but they they do stupid stuff, like they close the stud book, so they don't allow for new blood to enter into these gene pools. And over time with just picking too many popular sires that, you know, that, that yeah. birth like 80% of the new dogs in each generation, you get really limited genetic diversity. And so there've been studies over time, like, you know, how could we bring back in, you know, genetic diversity into programs, but not lose, you know, the domestication factor or what we like about our breeds. So they, they still look the same and act the same, but they, they keep getting new, you know, a little refresh on the genes. And there's a really cool experiment in, um, it was in Russia, it was in Bialev, Russia, where uh, the, the, the scientist's name was Bialev, Dmitry Bialev. And um, it was like in like, Siberia. And the he basically took, um, when the fur industry, they used to raise foxes for fur uh, to make fur coats. And the foxes are notoriously smelly and they're very kind of cantankerous. So it's hard to raise them in, uh, high numbers in in together in a small amount of space, and so the the the, the reason this the, the the government wanted to pay for this research was if you could domesticate them, you could have more of them in the same space and it would be more efficient, and you wouldn't have to keep them all in individual cages, and it'd be easier for less trained handlers to not lose fingers trying to feed them and that kind of stuff, right? But they, what they found is when they took these these silver foxes or these black foxes that you know the, the silver foxes are like very just all black. Um, when they started, they, 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 every generation, they just pick the most docile males and females to create the next generation. And within a few generations, they started noticing they, they, they succeeded in domesticating them. They became very dog-like or cat-like, um, kind of a mix of the two. Uh, but their ears went from being perk to flop. And then these color patterns that, that were never really seen in the wild started showing up. So the kind of like the white collars and the white tip tails and the white bellies and the little white toes that you, you'd recognize on a lot of breeds like Border Collies have it and Great Danes have it. They call it like Irish white. Um, it just appeared out of nowhere, like piebald colors. So they started looking a lot more like dogs and dog breeds. And they started acting a lot more like dog breeds. And they, they did it in like 30 generations, which wow. for animals can be done, you know, in, in you know, about that many years really um so it's really, really kind of crazy but i was i was thinking like man i would what, 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 wouldn't you like to have a cute little domesticated fox like they're so cute and fluffy and they're nice and they're like a dog but like they're cleaner and um they smell so I, way worse well here's the thing is the, the smell kind of went away a lot of the smell was associated with like this the pheromones and the hormones of like being wild and using it for scenting and when when you just bred the docility a lot of that just just disappeared. So the um, you, you could have your cute little fox and not be you know super rank about it. And uh, so I actually looked into it, but the uh, very few states in America allow you to have foxes domesticated without a super rare permit. So I'm like, well, there goes that idea of becoming a billionaire importing Russian foxes to sell in the pet market. But um, I, I'm with you, Presto, on it'd be really cute to have a, a pet bear because. You know, a pet bear, a pet fox. I mean, I love dogs, but wouldn't you want another one too? Like a little, a little, you know, a little Paddington. And yeah, mm -hmm. of all cute. the weird pets. Have y'all seen the the meme? I bears. love this meme on Facebook of the uh, the wolves, right? Saying, "Hey, look, there's humans over there. What, let's go over there and befriend them. What could, yeah. What's the worst could yeah. happen?" And the next one is that little like Chihuahua in his knit sweater. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Guys. Exactly. Right. That was the worst thing that could happen. And yes, a little dog in, a, in an outfit with a tutu. And yes, it, it, it is true. We, we, we did that to them. It is our fault. And um, but yeah, this does make some, some good gaming fodder. I can totally see some evil mad scientist trying to domesticate some like, you know, Chupacabras. crazy right, Chupacabras, yeah. right? Like uh, who would not want a cute little like, uh, God, what was mm. the name? Uh, don't feed them after midnight. Don't get them wet. Gremlins. 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 Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Good. There has definitely been some experiments like that. Um, usually they last six months to a year and then the professor disappears mm -hmm. and the program is shut down. Ooh. Maybe Never some of the cages are empty. Maybe not, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. There's, there's been that a time or two. Just want to see the revenge of the goats on all the chupacabras. <laughs> the goats evolve instead. Yep. Like enough of this. We have to evolve. We have fangs now. Well, there's <laughs> we'll definitely an, on you. there's definitely an underground exotic pet market in Pine Box that people don't really understand. Ooh. I, I need this as a supplement now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. Different yes. companions that you can have in the back of your truck. Yeah. Well, it needs to use it. It's become a very big product line, right? I mean, there's, there's, you know, the original book, there's the adventures, there's degrees of horror. Um, and now you know, ETU study abroad, like it's, it's a well-supported thing. I, I, we've even gotten calls like during the, uh, the Kickstarter when it first did that Kickstarter, the crowd funder, because we are game on tabletop, go there now. Uh, there's like three or four days left. So pledge people pledge and, um, you get it right away. It's good. The uh, people are talking about like, Hey, what about different age groups? So like, ETU grad school or ETU mm -hmm. high school or younger. So the uh, can you give us any hints on where you guys think you might take ETU in the future? Uh, I think that we're not supposed to give hints. Oh, okay, so we're not associated so with I, I, I will say that we have two full book size projects underway that will um, be pretty awesome. And I did awesome. turn in. I did yeah. turn in a mini plot point to Shane about a year ago and don't know when he's planning on using it, but it's pretty awesome too. Uh, yeah. I mean, it has a lot of ETU history in it. Yeah. So we haven't stopped writing. Um, we, we have things in development. Study Abroad is one of them, right? I mean, Study Abroad started really three years ago yeah. and um, pandemic kind of slowed things down. I think we would have seen it earlier if it hadn't been for that. But um, but yeah, we we are still developing for ETU. We are not done with Pine Box yet. Not at all. And Ed and Preston are just slow. Yep. Well, Trying I mean, done yet? We're like, well, we're starting. Is, yeah. <laughs> As developers, what are your what what are some of your absolute favorite little things about ETU? Hi. I fun. love the fight song. <laughs> I know it sounds yeah, weird, but when I get everybody at the convention to stand up yeah. and sing that, it just it makes me feel so happy. It, it is a great thing to do at a convention. Start start the table by everyone having to sing the fight song. Even when I run a game, I'm like, you sing the fight song, I'll give you an extra mini. Yep. And you Everybody usually, does it. Yeah, people will do it. Yeah. It, it is fantastic. Having been on the receiving end, not at the table, but like you're like you're just getting started with a game session, and all of a sudden, one quarter of the room, like the whole table stands up and starts yep. doing the fight song. It's pretty hilarious. Yep. So. Yep. yep. I've seen that happen at lots of the conventions. It's yep. pretty awesome. Yeah, and we're gonna get back to that soon. Soon we will do yep. it again. Yep. And, and and you, Preston, what's your favorite little thing? Oh man, it, it's really hard to pick. I do love the fight song. Um, you know, the, I'm pretty proud of the ritualism rules. They were, uh, I like the tables with the common and the, the exotic items. I think that's really cool. And it, it lends itself to uh, adventures in and of itself. And I mean, I mean, it was it was cool enough that now there's a, um, ritualism has been brought into the main Savage Worlds core book. So uh, I, I really dig the ritualism. Yeah. So yeah, Pinnacle is kind of like a gelatinous cube. If you're good and tasty enough, they'll just consume your content and make it yep. part of Pinnacle. So you guys yep. are like the first ones to blaze the trail on that. The um, and everybody else is hopeful that they, could, they too could be cool enough to get you know part of Pinnacle. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Well, Shane took a took a part of the uh, the our idea of twelve to midnight and said, "Okay, I can just join us." <laughs> right. One of us. Yeah. One of us. Yeah. <sighs> So the uh, here's here's another question. So the um, looking forward, uh, are you guys going to team up for anything outside of ETU or Pine Boxes? Any other properties? Anything else that that you've uh, been thinking about doing, writing, publishing? Um, we haven't really talked about it ourselves. I know in the back of my mind, I have ideas for two different um, last parsec adventures. Mm -hmm. Probably just like 30, you know, the 32 pager books, probably not like a full size book, 
but uh, I, I'd like to get around to writing those one of those days. One, I, I better not spill the beans on what the idea is, but um, right. yeah, you haven't I, even told me. I don't. <laughs> oh. But um, yeah, I, I have some ideas to kind of branch out and do something for Last Parsec. But other than that, no, I think we're we're um, pretty focused on supporting the pine box setting for for a while yeah i've got so much background stuff for pine box that i've found i've, I've got i don't know 12 hours to midnight which was a complete campaign that we never published that i want to redo oh uh, there's actually a campaign called 12 to midnight yeah 12 hours to midnight yeah Ooh. and i've still got um uh house on dell island that i've rewritten a couple of times and not happy with and so maybe someday that'll see the light of day uh, I would I would like to get back with Sean Preston and work on Agents of Oblivion. That's one of my babies, and I, I love that Agents of Oblivion stuff. So, you know, and I've always wanted to write some other things as well. So, uh, just a it's just a matter of for me, it's time. You know, it's just where am I going to use my time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I also have Crucible, which is a a long standing about ten year campaign that I've run for. For friends, and uh, it's something I would like to publish someday, but who knows if that'll ever happen. So. Ooh, what's the general theme there? Can you give us a few keywords? Uh, it's 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 a uh, you play characters that are either hunters or you're blooded. That means you uh, you you have descended from the grace of angels, and you're fighting against demons. And it's basically a nephilim versus angels kind of thing here on earth you know? oh, so it's not cool. really christian it's it's more just you know the idea of demons and angels and and your descendants and you're fighting in this eternal war and uh, of course there's lots of monsters and creepiness involved i've got I've got about 21 different bloodlines of the bad guys that you can be and, oh, that's and awesome. it's a blast we, we love playing it we played it for 10 years now so it's just a when if i ever if I ever get around to actually sitting down and saying, let me write this up. Mm -hmm. um, oh my I, gosh, so yeah, people. Of, but to, to a couple of folks with this, but a lot of folks are afraid of it because of the religious idea of demons and angels. It's, we just have fun with it. Oh no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm writing something similar. So I'm like, yes, this is good. We need to talk. Because people throw money at Ed and Preston, like throw all the money at them throw right money. now. So they have I'm more teacher. time. I need every dollar. It's, bring, bring this to fruition. This needs to happen. Yeah, please right. so yes uh, if you want to back etu study abroad it is on game on tabletop we threw the link in the chat but it's game on tabletop.com we're on the front page um there is what three days left it is fully funded um they recently threw in some cool fun extras like a whole um audio drama uh that was written by yeah. Yeah. aaron Rodgers. that's awesome um seriously if you if you have not played in etu yet you can get a great deal on like all the ETU things all together, one shipping price, so yep. convenient, get it all. That's the alumni of the year um, level. And I, someone was commenting before, like, oh, I, I miss stretch goals. Like, all the stretch goals are already in there. Like, they're, they're, they're baked all in. Bundled. Yeah. Just, just and, back it and get them. Like, yep. yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the picture right now because, like, I think we can do this. Let's see, share screen <laughs> and then do. And the on top of that, you know, if you are still only wanting the PDF stuff, you can go for all PDF stuff. You can go for all the physical yep. in-print stuff. It is really whatever you want. Do both. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot of stuff. Right? For one fitty, people, one fitty, you get, like, a soundtrack. You get Degrees of Horror. You get the etu original book the etu study abroad book you get horror for the holidays you get the creature features you get the handouts there's a soundtrack there's the um the savage worlds um explorer there's like really cool nice magazines um the three different explorers that etu is featured in there's some great stories in there um there's pine box perils um, there's the archetype cards. There's the the little miniatures, the cutout miniatures. What do you call those things? The the cardboards, little pawns. Yep. the pawns. The uh, I mean, seriously, like for 150 bucks, you get all of that. Like no stretch goals needed. Just like get it, get it. and then <laughs> the Ed class can... rings in that too. That's one yep. of my favorites. And mm -hmm. for yep. a long time, nobody ever talked about it. And recently on the uh, the ETU game side on Facebook, people started talking about class ring. It made me feel really good because. People always say, well, it's so Scooby-Doo, and it's just that. I'm like, no, play Class Rain. You'll see that it can be played as yep. total horror. And oh, I'm changing my God. answer earlier that when you were asking about favorite thing about ETU, because mm -hmm. looking at all of these things appear on the screen, stuff. 
the the handouts that we did i i really had fun with the handouts yeah. you um you can get a little handout that's um your student id card like uh there was a, a diploma mm -hmm. there was a welcome letter like all of these fun cool handouts for your campaign to to kick things off and then to use throughout the campaign yeah at chupa Cabracon a couple of years ago uh, a family of gamers brought their was she 90? Something like uh, that. 90, I think it was 90 year old grandma. To, and we, we gave her an official diploma from ETU. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, so that's sweet. Nice. See, like why, do, why don't you want to support these people? They're so amazing. They're awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Now, we are lucky to have you guys in the Savage community. I think you guys are inspirations for all of us. Um, I know that Chris Fox and I have looked up to you guys on trying to, you know, how you guys did it with, with 12 to Midnight and how we wanted to set up our little publishing arm. And I think, like you, like, we wanted to be published more than be publishers. But, you know, there's both there. We, we also want to get our friends published, too. And, and just, you know, how we're setting that up carefully and doing the, you know, the right things going about it. And, invite and just, all your friends to become part of your company. That's right, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, a, 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 a half share versus yeah. $0 split 12 ways is just the same as $0 That's split it. two yeah. ways. So it's, it's fantastic. The uh, But it, it is. I mean, it, printing, it, it's crazy. It's expensive. There's this weird thing in the role playing market where like people's thoughts on what books should cost has not kept up with inflation, let alone mm, no. the quality of the books. Like if you look at what you were paying for an RPG book 25 years ago that was really crappy black and white art on rather crappy mm -hmm. paper with yep. like cardboard thin glued on covers. And now everyone's getting like glossy paper with art on every other page, and it's all high quality art on very nice offset print, and it's stitched and settled back and all that stuff. And people are like, "Nope, I'm not going to pay more than forty dollars for a book ever." So I don't know. Change your mind, folks. Like Change your mind because you could drop that on intruders in your house and probably kill <laughs> them. Yeah. The um. But yeah, no. I mean, you, you guys have done. I mean, the ETU is it's fantastic from beginning to end. Um. The it, we we made it part of our living campaign with the RMS, and we did a four year, you know, every semester. Like this, to do have two major conventions a year, so we did fall and spring semesters. And um, you well, know, and it, now with study fun. abroad, you're getting an experience that maybe you didn't have in real life. Going to visit yeah. Costa Rica or London or Poland or, or Italy, you get to right. explore these locations through the lens of a local, which is fantastic. And hopefully, then that inspires you to go visit those places as well. You might as well have a good the, the cool thing is you can you can get on Google, you can do Google Street View. I, I mean, there's all this research you can do about, you know, you can't do Google Street View in Pine Box, unfortunately. But you can do Google Street View. Oh, in we had thought Turin about that at or, one point. We were gonna make yeah. a fake map and yeah. put it in Google. Yeah. That would be a lovely yeah. anniversary treat for ET. Maybe, maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. But at any rate, there's a there's a lot of research you can do to to um, really immerse yourself in those settings that um, I think it would be fun to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Or find your GMs in those places and have them yeah. take pictures for you and put them up. You know, yeah. there's so many different things. We're all so connected now. Yeah. There's really no excuse not to have a lot of fun. And you know what? If gamers around the world get together and game, maybe the world will become a more peaceful place. Hey, amen to that, brother. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, with that, guys, if you haven't done it already, get on it. Game on Tabletop, East Texas University Study Abroad. 150 gets you all of the ETU stuff, like all of it ever. There's a soundtrack. There is an audio book. There's all the stuff in hardcover print, all the handouts, even the conversion guides in print. Um, good value for all. I mean, unbeatable value for all of that. Uh, but if you already have all the collection and you just need a new book, there's also easy ways to get that too. And um, let's see, if you want to game with us in person, uh, check out pegink.com on the news. We're going to be gaming in um, Deadwood coming up in August, uh, middle of August for a long four day weekend in Deadwood. And then the beginning of next year, leaving out of Florida, Orlando, we're going to go on a six day cruise uh, down to Costa Maya, Belize, and Cozumel. And uh, we might actually see some of the cool undead temple cenote uh, 
craziness that you might get a little taste of in the Costa Rica chapter. Um, and yeah, if you want to be cool like um, Presto and see some sharks or some sea turtles and all that fun stuff, that's also on the menu. Or if you want to not be like Ed and you want to go see some bears, you can that's <laughs> definitely in Edwood. Um, we're, we're out there in, in wilderness. You can go see Devil's Tower or take a little trip on your way into Yosemite and um, or Yellowstone. Yellowstone's closer, not Yosemite. Yosemite's California. Yellowstone. And um, yeah, guys, so join us for gaming. We're, we're getting back to gaming live. And, um, you know, it's it's been too long, but now that you know, the vaccine's out and everyone's getting healthy. And um, oh, my Owen Lean walks in like two seconds before, before leaving. If you uh, so, time yeah. zone, you were off by an hour, Owen. Right. <laughs> Darn, Darn. So if you want to see more Owen, you can see we interviewed Owen. It's on video on yeah. demand on twitch.tv slash peg inc. Um, you can also see Ed Wetterman. He was running or playing in. Oh, my. I've got to show this. We have to show this. Here is a picture of Ed in the actual play. Um, <laughs> so, yes, he played Craig Driver, the old man local. And there's a picture of him in his college years with the handsomest devil mu uh, mullet business <laughs> in the front and uh, party in the back. Nice. Um, so where in the ETU you get up. So the um, if you haven't seen that, we did an, an actual play. Gilbert Gallo, who was on our previous stream today, uh, game mastered it, and um, Ed was one of the amazing players. So that's on the video on demand on uh, twitch.tv slash pegging. So you can watch all the videos, you can buy all the books, and then you can come on all the trips we're going to do this next year. And with that, like, I mean, what, what else are we doing, what guys? What more would you want? What, I mean... I mean we, we got nothing else going on. We're boring people. We're just <laughs> diving, snaking, noodling, noodling, needling. I've heard it both noodling. ways. Um, yeah. Avoiding bears and bear spray, um, writing books, going on adventures. And then if you come to Deadwood, you can also shoot me in the face with a paint gun with a six shooter because that's on the docket because it'll be fun. And nice. um, yeah, guys, it'll be fun. So uh, I see any other last comments. Oh, oh, Owen. It's just Owen. Love you, Owen. You can see Owen and his – he takes you on a trip from um, where he lives to all of the locations he wrote about in yeah. the Great Britain chapter of East Texas University Study Abroad. So there's more exciting video all there for you on demand. Go watch it. You're not doing anything else on Sunday night. So back – Back the the pledge manager, the game on tabletop, game on tabletop.com, front page, East Texas University, study abroad. And that puts food on all of our table and allows us to bring you all these cool things. So yep. thanks guys. Thanks guys. Thanks. Thank you.